in-depth, investigative. This is KXAN News Today. It will be another wet day here in Central Texas. Thanks for joining us. I'm Tom Miller. I'm Sally Hernandez. Sean Kelly is here. Chan, our best chances of some heavy rain come tonight. Yeah, tonight with the risk of severe weather. So we've got the potential for some thunderstorms that will be slow moving, producing maybe some flooding. And then we have to watch out for maybe an isolated strong to severe storm. So we've got a lot here in the forecast to talk about. We've got some heavy rain chances, not so much for the daytime, but yeah, as we just mentioned, late tonight into early tomorrow morning, that's a time frame we're really keying in here on the heaviest rain and the potential for those severe weather risks. No severe weather out there right now, but we do have one spot shower moving into the Austin area early on this Wednesday morning. Good Wednesday, everyone. Quiet conditions, a live look on the Austonian weather camera with some of that rain in the area. 73 degrees, it's warm and it is muggy. 72 in Lano, 73 in Horseshoe Bay. Metro temperatures here, 73 from Lakeway down through Buda into the 70s as well. And then out towards the east, we're into the 70s here for the most part from Bastrop out through Muldoon, 73 degrees. So here it is, those rain chances only get higher as we head into the second half of the day today into the overnight. Coming up, we'll talk about more of the timing of those storms, how slow moving they'll be, how much rain we could see, and all eyes on our strongest cold front of the season arriving early next week. We'll have that for you in the next few minutes. Thank you, Sean. This morning, police are investigating after another violent night in Austin. Person killed overnight in South Austin happening at a home on Mickelson Drive. This is off Bradshaw Road in the Onion Creek area. The police say one person was killed and they've taken a person of interest into custody for questioning. A police say they do not believe the public is in danger and this is the 56th homicide so far this year in Austin. If anything I've ever done in my life, that was the, the most messed up mistake I've ever done. I didn't see that man was well done. Emotional testimony in the murder trial of Austin police officer Christopher Taylor. It continues today. Taylor is the man accused of shooting and killing Mike Ramos during a confrontation with police in the South Austin apartment complex parking lot back in 2020. The woman you heard from there called 911 on Ramos that evening and she wiped away tears in the stands after admitting to the jury that she told dispatch Ramos had a gun but she never saw one. The woman apologized to the Ramos family. Officer Taylor shot and killed Ramos, as we mentioned, in the parking lot during the confrontation of 2020. Jurors also heard from Ramos's girlfriend, and she was just feet away when Taylor shot and killed Ramos. Rebecca Garcia told jurors that when police arrived, she was in the passenger seat of Ramos's car. She said she didn't know what was happening or what police were asking her to do. She got out of the car and was face down on the ground when Ramos started driving away and then she heard gunshots. The police officer started yelling out demands, um, but it wasn't just one officer. It was several of them at the same time. We didn't know which way to go or, or who to listen to um, because if we made a wrong step, we could have, you know, we could have been shot. They didn't understand that we didn't have any weapons or we didn't have what they were looking for and we didn't even know why they were, you know, had why they had the guns pointed at us. You can catch up on our coverage and the investigation at KXAN.com. How many homes should be allowed on a lot? It's a question people in Austin are talking about tomorrow. The city considering land development code changes. And while some say it will make homes more affordable, others have concerns. Nabil Ramadna has more. Rallying in East Austin. Say no to this proposal. Say no to this proposal. A group of people from all over Austin spoke out against Austin City leaders proposed plan allowing more units on a property. The home initiative is dangerous to low income renters and homeowners because it drives and spurs speculation, gentrification and irresponsible development. Property owners can already build two units on most residential lots. This proposal would make it legal to build up to three homes, including tiny homes. Council needs to take the time to visit with us 
to get her input. Anna Aguirre is with the Austin Neighborhoods Council. She says there are other ways to create affordable housing in Austin, like working with the neighborhoods. I don't know of anybody that is against affordable housing. We're just asking how do you do it? and you do it responsibly. We got to do things and make it a little bit easier for more folks to be able to afford housing in Austin. Greg Anderson is with Habitat for Humanity. He says the home ordinance is what the city needs. The number one way to guarantee displacement in a growing community is to limit your new housing supply, which unfortunately our outdated code does very well. Anderson says adding more units could add an income stream to current property owners. We're really trying to tackle the housing affordability uh, challenge. Louisa Brinsmade with Council Member Poole's office says informing the public in upcoming meetings will be crucial. How do we create options for homeowners? How do we house more middle income families in our neighborhoods? How do we get that done? Help us to find solutions. Nabil Ramadna, KXAN News. The city is hosting a public hearing on Thursday on the home ordinance to hear some feedback. It'll also host an open house on November 6th. Going in depth here, last year Austin lost an appeals court ruling over its years-long attempt to loosen housing development rules. It began with Code Next in 2018, but a group of homeowners won the argument saying the city council failed to get enough public feedback on proposed changes. An off-duty pilot accused of trying to bring down an Alaska Airlines flight. Why he says he did it and the charges he's facing. And a new home to cover downtown. A breakthrough for Austin's firefighters kicked out of their station because of construction. Good morning, a live look outside. A cloudy, muggy, and a little bit wet start to your Wednesday morning. We're happy to have you here with us on KXAN News Today and want to share this, some new details coming out about the off-duty pilot accused of trying to bring down an Alaska Airlines flight. Investigators say Joseph Emerson took, told them that he took psychedelic mushrooms 48 hours before the incident. He said he had been depressed and believed he was experiencing a mental breakdown. The 44-year-old is charged now with more than 150 counts, including 83 counts of attempted murder. He pled not guilty to all of the state charges. Emerson had been sitting in a flight deck jump seat in the cockpit when he allegedly tried to pull two engine shut off handles. NBC News Tom Costello reports this morning as Emerson has another hearing coming up to talk about bail. The Alaska Airlines pilot is now on suicide watch in a county jail in Oregon just a couple of days after that incident in which he allegedly pulled the fire suppression handles to shut down the engines on that Horizon Air flight that was at altitude cruising to San Francisco. And he admits he put at risk 84 lives, including uh, his own. He says that he was having a mental breakdown of some sort. In FBI and local police affidavits, he claimed that he actually had taken psychedelic mushrooms within 48 hours of the flight. He claimed he'd been depressed for six months and he recently lost uh, a very, very close friend. On the Today Show, we're going to go in depth on the charges against him, on the evidence against him, what he is said to have told police and FBI investigators, and then a psychiatrist will tell us what, if anything, can be done to try to spot signs that somebody is in a mental health crisis before it's too late. A violent case of mail theft in Central Texas. The two men suspected of robbing and assaulting mail carriers. World Series is set for Friday night in Arlington. We'll tell you about the matchup. And Steve Sarkeesian will have a first-time starter at quarterback when the Horns are back home for the first time in a month. It's coming up. Good morning, everyone. It is Wednesday, October the 25th, as we take a live look outside. Another warm start to your day. Some heavy rain expected later on. We're going to talk to Sean about exactly when you could expect that and the rest of your week forecast. It was a violent case of mail theft here in Central Texas after mail carriers robbed and assaulted, according to the Department of Justice. The suspects are 22-year-old Cameron Hamilton from St. Louis and 26-year-old Jonathan Drangel from Austin. According to court documents, the two allegedly robbed two mail carriers in Round Rock on September 30th. The Department of Justice also says that Rangel assaulted multiple mail carriers in Austin and Georgetown in the days prior. Each time he demanded the postal employees give him the master key that gets into all the mailboxes on the route. 
Postal Service says crimes against mail carriers are on the rise. More than 400 postal workers were robbed in on the job last year. And in the first half of this year, we already hit 305 robberies. Going in depth, there are several ways that you can protect yourself from mail theft. According to the U.S. Postal Service, you should contact the sender as soon as possible if you don't get your mail on time. Be careful about what you do send. Do not risk sending money, cash by mail. When you're shipping packages, you can use the hold for pickup option and the recipients can collect the package at their local post office. Now, when you're mailing something important, consider requesting signature confirmation and always pick up your letters and packages as soon as you're able to do so and make sure that you are not out for an extended period of time without doing that. With Halloween approaching, Airbnb is launching a new system to stop party house rentals. This one comes with artificial intelligence, Airbnb already limiting short stays around the holidays in certain instances to cut down on those damaging parties that can happen. Last year, the company revealed it canceled about 1,500 bookings over Halloween, and across Texas, a total of 11,000 people were discouraged from booking out their homes for Halloween. You can read more right now on KXAN.com, including how this new tech works. Um, I took a key step in securing my Halloween costume yesterday. Okay. Good for you. Which is ordering some of the, some of the pieces. Okay. You, yes. know, you know, a lot of those parties are going to be indoors yes. because That's of right. how cold it's going to be. Mm -hmm. You want to make sure you arrange that your costumes are prepared That's for right. some of the chilly. Weather friendly. Weather friendly <laughs> because... It is going to be a bit cold with temperatures into the 50s, potentially for highs as we head into Monday into Tuesday. So at least we'll have Monday to maybe get our bodies used to the cooler weather because it will be uh, a shock to the system here when we go from a full week in the 80s down into the 50s with even 40s for lows. A live lookout in Georgetown as we start off your morning. Good morning to you with temperatures right now into the lower 70s. 72 in Burnett, sitting at 71 in Lamp Passes. We're at 73 from Cameron down into the uh, Giddings area. 74 in Lockhart and Luling there. 74 in Flatonia. We've got a few spot showers moving into the area just north and west of Austin up through 183 into the Lamp Passes area. And we're also watching out for some heavy rain later on this evening evening into the night and into tomorrow morning, some of which could produce an isolated strong to severe storm out in the hill country. I'm not overly concerned about that. What we do have to watch out for is the potential for some localized flooding, maybe some flash flooding, especially out towards the hill country and a three out of four risk there because of how slow moving these storms will be. So throughout the day today, pretty similar to yesterday, periods of some light rain, maybe a quick moving downpour and isolated thunderstorm, but the main event, the main line of storms moves in between about 9 and 11 p.m. out in the hill country, very slow moving. By 1, 2 a.m., it's still in the hill country and eventually pushing into the metro early tomorrow morning between about 4 and 7 a.m. That line of thunderstorms still in the area by 8 a.m. now from the metro out towards our eastern viewing area by 9, 10, 11 o'clock, gradually tapering off, but still could see some lingering showers and thunderstorms into the early afternoon as well. So this will be the best chance of rain that we have this week will be for tonight. And we could see upwards of one to maybe three inch rainfall totals on top of the good amount of soaking rain that we saw yesterday. Some areas yesterday picking up over an inch to an inch and a half. So look at the seven day forecast. We're doing a full week with temperatures into the 80s. And then there's that cold front setting the stage for a cold Halloween, cold and damp with periods of showers with temperatures overnight falling down into the 40s. Two families need your help after a hit and run crash off of East 6th Street over the weekend. Last Sunday night, two young men were hit on a scooter, one suffering a traumatic brain injury. Jacob Caldwell and Wesley MacArthur were in town this weekend for Formula One with their families. After dinner, the two joined Jacob's stepbrother for drinks off East 6th Street. Well, taking a scooter back to their Airbnb, family members say a driver ran a red light, hitting Jacob and Wesley near Komal and East 6th Street. Jacob needs to undergo surgery for a broken nose, and Wesley is still in the hospital. We headed through an intersection, you know, with the green light, and, you know, next thing I know, we were on the ground. So um, just one of those things that happened so fast that um, I can't really recollect 
everything that happened in those few seconds. KXAN digital reporter Kelsey Thompson has more on the search to find that driver over on KXAN.com. An important RSV antibody drug is in short supply just as the virus starts to gear up this season. The CDC is alerting doctors about limited availability for the drug and they're telling healthcare workers to go ahead and prioritize the medication for the infants who are at the highest risk of severe RSV. That includes saving the larger doses for babies under six months and those underlying conditions as well. The drug maker says the demand for the product was higher than anticipated and the vaccine acts similar to one of the delivering antibodies directed to the blood with an injection. So it's only for babies, by the way, but in short supply still. Property tax bills are in the mail for those in Williamson County. Those statements started going out this week. And these have been adjusted to reflect the state's efforts to help owners impacted by higher taxes. KXAN's Mercedes Hernandez shows us the difference this is making. Eric Peterson has lived in Cedar Park since 2007. Since then, he's seen the value of his home and the taxes that come with it go up. The tax taxable values have really increased every year. That is until now. This year, the state has put $18 billion worth of property tax cuts for homes and businesses on the ballot in November. Williamson County has already sent out property tax bills as if those changes have already passed. Peterson also has a real estate company and says the difference for his and his clients' homes would be drastic. My taxes personally on my house are about $3,000 lower this year. I just pulled up somebody. This is a house that's listed for sale for $400,000. School taxes went down 69% from $2333 to $721 this year. Larry Gaddis is the tax assessor collector for Williamson County. He says these savings are an estimation. If the changes fail, the county will reconfigure people's bills. We will have to send out um, revised tax bills that, that show an increase in, in the taxes that they currently are. Trey Bates with Texas Realtors says even with these changes still in the hands of voters, the state's market is holding steady. We're seeing a lot of demand still, even though we've seen some drop off in some of the buying, buying activity. In Williamson County, Mercedes Hernandez, KXAN News. That measure Mercedes talked about is Proposition 4. You can vote on it now during early voting ahead of Election Day next month. Among other things, it raises the homestead exemption from 40000 up to $100,000. Travis County is stepping in to help out the Austin Fire Department. And this is after renovations at station number one left downtown without the coverage it's used to. So safety issues started to pop up during renovations, which meant everyone had to leave the station at 5th and Trinity. Travis County commissioners approved an agreement to let AFD use space at the Ned Granger building on 11th Street. An official soap to have firefighters and ambulance crews move in within the next week or two. Unfortunately, due to the renovation, we had to move our firefighters out of that station for approximately six months plus or minus and because of that we are in need of temporarily relocating them that will keep us in close proximity to downtown austin to help us with our response time this agreement's going to last six months while the renovations continue at station one the space will be free of charge but austin will pay for the utilities this is KXAN Sports, brought to you by Thomas J. Henry. Good morning to you, Longhorns and BYU on Saturday. Texas trying to stay right there and the tie for second place at worst in the Big 12 standings. And for Steve Sarkeesian now, the guy that's made a living off of developing quarterbacks, he'll be dealing with a first-time college starter, most likely Malik Murphy, but he talks about Arch Manning every time he talks about this situation with Quinn Ewers being out. So what about the game plan? What do you do with a quarterback? Well, you adjust. It's not always about the idea of the play and putting it on a whiteboard because there's a lot of plays that look good, but what do they do well? I think it's important that they get confidence early is always helpful, but you never know how a game's going to go. These guys are elite competitors. Uh, I'm not concerned about them, you know, fighting through when adversity strikes. But I do want to make sure that I'm, I'm giving them the opportunity to do the things that they've shown us that they're good at and that they like. Um, because, you know, 
Saturday does is going to be a test enough. It doesn't need to be a final exam as far as, you know, let's test them on and things that they might know or might not know. I, I want to test them on the stuff that I know they know really well. Uh, I hope they get 100%. This is an open book test. I hope they, I hope they play great. Flip side, BYU has Keaton Slovis. He's been a starter at USC, a starter at Pitt, and now a starter for the Cougars. World Series is set. It's an all-wild card affair. Arizona beats Philly last night, so the Diamondbacks will go to Arlington. Games 1 and 2, Friday, Saturday. Last time, all-wild card World Series 2014. Giants beat the Royals. Giants led by Bruce Bochy, their manager. Back to you. For those listening on the KXAN Today podcast, thanks for joining us. Here's what else we're tracking for you in the 5 a.m. hour. The Williamson County Fair and Rodeo kicks off today. We are live from the Williamson County Expo Center with what you can expect to see.